All right, I call the May, May 5th, May 10th, 2022 study session of the Littleton City Council to order. Um, all of council is present, and tonight we have two items to discuss here. Uh, first is an update from Human Resources, and then after them we'll talk about procurement. But um, turn it over to Mark, give us an update on Human Resources. All right. Thank you, Mayor. So we have Noel, Noel Mink, our HR Director, and Jacqueline Stewart, our Deputy HR Director, making a presentation here. So we have a couple of items here that just be more informational. Council has asked about it in the past. We certainly discussed recruitment and organizational development at the retreat here recently. But we're also going to talk about um, the DEI issue that the council has asked about starting again this past retreat. So we have a recommendation. So we are looking for a direction from council on that item. So with that, Noel, Jacqueline, turn over to you two. Thank you. Um, some of you may know that today's my last day with the city of Littleton. Um, <laughs> and um, I remember my first council retreat with Littleton and we went through and we had discussion. And one of the things that the council members said was, Sometimes it's nice if we get a kudos too. And so I guess I wanted to just say quickly without being emotional, um, which is maybe a struggle, um, but I've had such a very, very positive experience with the council at the city of Littleton. Um, it's always been, it's always been, I mean, just such a pleasure to come and present and have the interaction and uh, 
Working Council <clears throat> members have taken an interest in me and have talked to me on personal level and professional levels. And I just feel like I've grown a lot being under the council that I've been under um, here. And I'm just very appreciative and thank you. And I just didn't want to let the night go without saying that. But I'm just very, very thankful that I had a chance to work with all of you. And, and I'll miss our astronomy talks. That's right. Our you astronomy will talks. You will be missed. Well, yeah, thank you. you thank you. Um, people are always the hardest to leave, right? So, all right, now. And good luck. So, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now that the emotion is gone, I just I didn't want to live with that regret without saying thank you thank for. You for um, all that I've learned and been able to do. I got probably the only standing ovation in my career from Littleton Council. So that was really exciting. Long time ago on a budget presentation. <laughs> that is a feather in my cap that I will tell everyone about for forever. So, um, <laughs> you are leaving. <laughs> so that was great. Well, I have Jacqueline with me. Um, she's our Deputy HR Director and will be acting as interim. So uh, the great thing about the HR team over the last four years, we've really moved to a place where no one in HR is working on anything in a silo. So the transition has been very smooth and seamless because everything I've been doing, Jacqueline's already been on the loop on. So we talk a lot about the issues that we're going to be talking about tonight. So I just want you to have full confidence with Ashley, with Jacqueline, uh, with Teddy, who you guys are all aware with now. Um, you're just in very, very capable hands. So we're going to have these three topics, which Mark talked about. Just want to give you kind of a state of the city on where we're at with retention and recruitment. Um, quick update on organizational values. Um, you know, that's been a big project that's been ongoing on our organizational development. And then, of course, our diversity, equity, and inclusion, along with the recommendation for your consideration. So our current labor market, as it stands right now, we have 28 open positions in various stages of recruitment. That can be uh, someone has just turned a notice to all the way that someone has accepted a position but hasn't started yet. So all of those steps in between, we have 48 vacancies. Uh, we're pleased to say it's down from our highest uh, where we're at 50, which is really, really challenging when we have about 320-ish um, regular status employees. That was a really big number for us to manage um, and obviously for the organization. And so we're working our way down and we're getting our numbers down. We do still see these trends with the great resignation of lower number of applicants. Um, sometimes it's very drastic, um, the number of applicants, the reduction. So we're still uh, looking at how we're sourcing our applicants, where they're coming from, who we're targeting, where we're advertising, uh, word of mouth, all of those things. And then we're also noticing that within the applicant pool that we're seeing a lower quality of applicants and we can attribute that to a couple of different things. The primary factor that I would say is everyone's doing what we're doing. We're hearing whispers that someone may leave. We're working to um, keep them, right? Because we know that attrition is very expensive. Retention always costs less, but it's continuity of operations, keeping all of that organizational experience. So um, the higher qualified applicants are just being accorded to stay where they're at. So uh, we still see that. And then of course, something that still is this theme ongoing, applicants are really, really vocal. We actually are asking questions in the application process about um, hybrid work schedules and what people think about that. And people are strongly asking for either fully remote or hybrid schedule. We've had people when we say, um, you know, right now there is flexibility for a hybrid schedule. Um, if we're unable to give promises or guarantees people are withdrawing from our selection process so or the applicant process. So I think that those are things that we all just have to keep our finger on and just watch how these trends play out across all industries on these. So here we have the open recruitments uh, by department. Okay, you can see a little bit better on that screen than on mine. Uh, You'll notice um, that, oh, like, oh gosh, police looks really high. Well, no, they have the most number of employees. So when we look across the organization, it really is kind of the same issue across the organization. Larger departments obviously have more vacancies because they have uh, larger FTE counts. So broken down by department, that's that's where we're currently at with our recruitments. Well, what, what position would the downtown city make on a downtown Manager, project manager, be considered? Is it, are they in that public count one? Right. Yeah. Sorry, public, was it public, it public works? works? Public works. Not communications. Like, public works or community development. I believe it's public works. It is. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the confirmation. Okay. Yep. And then 
we have uh, the compensation update uh, that we wanted to share with you. So you may remember we came back to you um, and asked for a little bit more than what was in the original budget uh, to a 4.25% increase and we deployed that out to all of our employees in April. And then you also granted us access um, to $175,000 to help aid in retention and recruitment efforts. And we have used some of that money, about $26,000 so far. It's all been spent to retain our employees um, via career progressions. So some of these are new career progressions. Some of them are already uh, in place and we're moving employees through them as a um, method to help retain and to provide people uh, market pay for the skills that they're able to do. Okay, so how does that work? I'm thinking about leaving and then you come and rush and push me up a level and I get more money. <laughs> I wasn't leaving, but... And then the next person goes, well, What's wait that? a second, I need to do that too. And I, it's it's in the witch department. <laughs> Before you know it, everybody's just I whispering hope they're not about the study I know. <laughs> No, there's a much larger process to it than that. So okay. HR is working with all the department directors. We're asking um, in the budget process and then also outside of that, where are your people at? Where should they go? Have they got new certifications? So some of these things, um, we've had more career progressions than this. They were just planned for. So there are times, though, when someone will say, hey, I'm an HR generalist, and I got a job offer to be an HR specialist. And we say, OK, so what is the work that you're doing? Could we move you? you meet the qualifications of this higher level job and we ask the real questions you know sometimes people say well I'm going here because uh, it's only about money for me or it's about vacation time so we're asking all of these questions so you um, have to have an offer in hand before you can negotiate yeah it, okay. yeah so, but we're also trying to be, it's just more amplified now because of the, the job market. Yeah, and we are uh, trying to be much more proactive so we've done stay interviews with almost every employee uh, we're teaching our supervisors how to do stay interviews and those are just built into our one-on-ones hey why do you like working here? What else can we do? Is there anything way that we can support you better? Um, because our market philosophy has made money not really the driving factor always. Sometimes it is, but not always. It's about opportunity. It's about training. It's about support, culture, how I feel like I'm valued. Is my voice heard? Uh, what am I able to contribute? So if someone says like, man, I have all these ideas and no one listens to me, that's a problem we could solve here. It just takes some patients, some training of supervisors, will they be willing to hang with us? So sometimes it's as simple as, um, you know, I'm leaving because, you know, I want to accrue more vacation because my spouse is pregnant and I want to be able to take more time off when the birth of child. Okay, well, we can certainly work with that. That's something that we can do. So uh, we're trying to just be uh, consistent on how we go about it, but also flexible to the individual. So uh, we have parameters, policies that we uh, look at when we say, okay, are we gonna adjust someone's leave in a one-time adjustment? What have we done before? Who approved it? Let's talk about it. We'll impact other folks. Worst case scenario, right? We do something uh, for one employee that creates like this ripple effect of like discontent or low morale or drives other people or creates this whirlwind of other people saying, well, me too, me too, me too. So uh, there have been times when we've done adjustments where we've adjusted an entire work group because we felt the market has demanded it and so they're not asking but we still have taken the efforts to retain them because we know one person may be leaving and if we want to retain that one person we're not going to create another additional problem because we have to think of the long term um, as well as just this immediate immediate piece to it. Noel, if I can interrupt for yes. a second, you might want to discuss a little bit about what our career progression specifically Yes. And the fact that they're new for us, we right. this is the conversation that Noel and, and I have had over time. We never did any of this kind of work in a proactive sense. So career progressions are really great. It's when you start as one level, and there could be a one, two, three senior, right? And so government uses these, and they're fantastic because it gives a line of sight for employees to say, I can grow and not have to be uh, competing against my coworkers at every turn in the bend, right? There's not um, always... Um, space for me to do that, but a career progression is helpful with that. So it is a give and take. So we work with the department director and the supervisor to say what should be included. Some things are really simple, like if you're looking in public works, do you have this certification? Are you cleared to operate these pieces of equipment? For another work group like HR, we could say, have you done a job evaluation? Have you worked on a citywide project? And so when they gain these certifications, uh, degrees, um, 
classes experience uh, that they can articulate in our meeting call and we put in a document that people can reach those, then they can career progress. Um, and so it's very, very helpful because employees grow, the skill set grows, um, and it has to be helpful to the organization. You know, it's like I could go get my pilot's license and then be like, hey, Mark, make me a senior <laughs> HR director. He's going to say, no, thanks. That doesn't really help our organization. We're not flying anywhere. Um, that's not what we want to do. So it has to be specific where it's aiding the organization as well. Um, government is one of the few places where we have these things, and us not using it has been a detriment. So the more we can use it, um, it's also helpful on the finance side because it becomes predictable. right? So if Jacqueline enters into a career progression, then I know every two years or three years for the next three or four years, she may progress. I can put that into a budget document. I can have a request on that. Um, and then it becomes more predictable for the budget, which is also very, very helpful. Do we have some data behind the retention rates in terms of like slowing attrition rates from staff using these funds to show that that was an effective way to do that? Yeah, I don't have those, but we can certainly get those to you. Uh, when we have made proactive retention, um, and the numbers are uh, higher than 20 people, certainly, um, I don't want to say the exact number, but we've had one person where it's failed. So the retention efforts are working and they're working over the long term, uh, which is great because I think that uh, for us, we're not just saying, hey, it's a money issue. Here's more money. We're saying, is it a money issue and a culture issue? Is it a supervisor and a training issue? So we're really trying to get the heart of the reason why someone would um, consider leaving because we know for us being market driven, uh, money is not always just the most simple answer. It's normally a little bit more complex. Sure. Yeah. What about like other um, cities that are of similar size near us? Do you find that obviously we're probably in competition with them too as well? And are we faring yeah, staffing wise? Yeah, we're, we're doing much better. You know, I get uh, calls from other HR directors and they're like, can you stop? You're hiring our people away, and we can't get any of the candidates. They're all going to Littleton. Um, That's what we say to South Suburban. Yeah. We're the bad ones in this relationship. I think that, you know, that that's a really helpful thing. I would say that this HR team, we have prided ourselves on being flexible and creative. So we like this thread of continuity where everyone is being treated fairly, but we're open to all ideas. I mean, um, that has just made it very personal for employees. And then it's also given the organization a lot of ability to just very quickly navigate through these things to retain people. Um, you know, obviously our foundation is Total Comp. So the foundation of Total Comp, our benefits and our pay is outstanding. We're in a very, very good spot for that. So then it comes to this place of culture and uh, how employees feel about the work that they're doing. And um, we've grown so much in the last four years in that area. So it's been helpful. Right. I'm going to let Jacqueline talk about um, this area. This is exciting. Um, Jacqueline will give you a little bit of background and then talk through our values. You may remember um, three years ago in the budget process, uh, council approved $125,000 and then a second appropriation of $75,000 to work on organizational development. In your packet, um, there's just a ton of information about the classes. Uh, when I first came, we did Classes? <laughs> Maybe I'm not quite sure how to say it. It wasn't very robust. It wasn't very man many and it wasn't meaningful. And so the uh, organization here, we have worked to really strategically, we interview all of our stakeholders and leadership every year. We ask what problems they want to solve and we use our training division to help solve those problems. Um, and it's become very, very robust. You may have seen we've taught 62 classes last year, our first year out of the gate. So employees are really benefiting from it. Um, so that's part of what we've done through organizational development. Then of course, we didn't have values and we worked really hard to get to this spot. We just finalized them maybe a week and a half last ago. Week maybe yeah, yeah, perfect. So Jacqueline will talk us, us through this slide. Yeah, so happy and excited to announce that our city values have been finalized as you see the floor on the screen there. Very collaborative process with our employees and leadership team. Uh, several workshops with our employees, several surveys to get their input on what is meaningful to them. How could they see this play through in their job? Across, or, uh, across the organization, across levels too. So ensuring that respect can be seen at the leadership level, but also at grounds or out in the field when people are working with our citizens. So um, very exciting. I'm happy about these. Uh, you'll see in your packet, it goes beyond just the definition, which you see on the screen, but also action statements. So how does this play out in a person's role through those action statements? And then we also have performance measures as well. So. 
the next step beyond this is um, how do we train people on our values and then how do we hold them accountable to that, which is having a performance measure as a part of the eval process. So um, if we go to the next slide, this talks about what our next steps are, which is branding. So we'll work internally with our communications department to create graphics that symbolize what each of those values look like. Uh, we'll also uh, revamp our annual evaluation process, which will include those performance measures, which could still use a little bit of tweaking. We want to make sure that it's relevant for all levels of the organization. And then we'll also work on training. So what, is, what do these values mean? How, what are the tools that we can pr provide our supervisors? Advisors, our employees so that they can live through those values and their day-to-day -day activities and what happens if you have a values conflict say your um, one of our values is first-rate service well what if you have to say no because you can't do that how do you work through the conflict of that value and have and uh, work through that with your supervisor or your team and then when you're when it's on your eval if you have to speak to it how can you have the uh, I guess the background to talk through those conversations. So we'll continue to work with our vendor that we've worked with in the past, CPS, who've seen us through up until this point with our mission, vision, values work to help us customize that training. We'll also work internally with um, HR and hopefully some uh, employees, what we can do a train the trainer program as well, so we can get them to uh, roll this out to the whole city. It will be values training, customer service training, as well as some project management training such as uh, agile training is what it is. So um, that's a work in progress. We're going to get uh, input from, I would say, our leadership team on that, as well as our lead team, some employees for that. And then the next step beyond that is once we have all, all of everyone trained at the city, how do we incorporate, they, incorporate this into onboarding? So living our values, uh, attracting talent, interviewing, the whole onboarding process is really going to be influenced by these values as well. So that's all in the works. Uh, I believe actually next week we have a, I have a meeting with a couple people, ZPS including that, to get that up and running. So more to come on that. We have a team of leadership and employees that are going to help us to create our new uh, performance evaluation. Our current one is pretty cumbersome. It's really, really long, and that's really prohibitive in people doing an evaluation that's meaningful. Our perspective, my perspective, having our values and having certainty that every employee can connect themselves to a city council goal is imperative. Um, those two things are just so important because when you see the work that you do and how it connects to it, a city council goal and what it means for the community, it makes your mundane tasks meaningful. Um, it provides perspective and con context for the work that you're doing and helps you to make better decisions. Uh, the values say, this is how I will do my work. And then the city council goals say, this is the work I should be doing because we can all get sidetracked. And I mean, I could say, we really need a training program on XYZ. And someone should be saying, how does that connect to a city council goal? And do we? Is that the most important work that we should be doing. Um, and I think that if we ask a lot of our employees, they would not be able to articulate where exactly they connect um, to those city council goals. So having those two elements together will help for make a meaningful um, performance review. We want it much shorter um, so that it, it can be timely. Um, you perhaps could even use it more than once a year, um, um, but it, that it will be meaningful to the employee, a real reflection of the work that they're doing. I think that's awesome. What is the tools training agile? What is that all? So that's um, a tool IT uses. I'm looking over there at Ashley. Um, it's a project management philosophy on how you can move <clears throat> projects through. It helps you manage your capacity, but there's a whole set of language around it. And so IT will say things and they're like, hey, in this sprint, and everyone's like, we're running? We're outside? <laughs> what are we doing? But a sprint has a really specific meaning in that agile. So we're looking at uh, a program that would give us all common language. So when I would say, hey, that's going to be on next week's sprint, or in two weeks, we'll add it to that, everyone's like, oh, Oh, okay, great. So it's just a tool for how we can manage our projects, our capacity, where the whole organization is on the same page, um, because we miss that right now. Isn't that kind of an old organizational culture, though, the lingo? Yeah, well, it can be. It depends on what we choose to use. I mean, I think at this point, if we just could select something, I mean, so that we're all speaking the same new. language. I mean, it's good to have, and no yeah. one is. Yeah, no, it's yeah. definitely not reinventing the wheel. It's just good, solid practice to have people trained in these things. Um, certainly. Before we right. jump into, yeah, I just, you know, I can't help myself. I just <laughs> love this topic. You know, I think, um, you know, I've been 
pretty committed to this issue here ever since I've been here. And, you know, we've talked with council many times that every organization will have a culture. It's whether or not you decide you want to kind of somehow shape that or steer it. And so I think we've done some really hard work trying to kind of point this organization in a direction largely around customer service, in my view. But I think raising the awareness and everything that Noel just shared here about how we connect their work to ultimately what the council wants to accomplish in this community. It's hard work, but I think it's a, a very solid strategy. There's tons of books written on this topic, and it does, in my view, present employees a clear vision of what's expected for them. It helps retain employees over time when they understand what is the vision here, where are we going, and they understand how they connect to the whole, whole thing. It just builds a much more positive, constructive culture. And quite honestly, it's a great place to work when that is all accomplished. Conversation right. killer, Mark. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> it was moving. <laughs> Is that what it was? Yeah. You know, I think oh, it's no, at a good point. Good. Sorry. What you're saying, I totally agree, because yeah. how many organizations have we worked in, and we're so siloed, and we don't know why we're doing something, and to connect it to the greater organization, I think is invaluable. It, absolutely. Plus, I also think that with my retirement, I think it's a good time for the next city manager to kind of step into the role, see the great work that's been accomplished, and let that person put their fingerprints on this thing as well. Because we're now just starting the stage where we take all this work and we're going to start to look at the practical application of this thing. And so the next city manager, I think, is going to welcome kind of the hard work, the foundation that's been set. And I will say that the city of Littleton is unique, uh, giving the biggest kudos to our employees. So the leadership team has done a tremendous amount of work. Then we got to this spot where the leaders are like, what are the employees thinking? Um, and hesitant to make a decision because we want our employees to feel like, man, these are things that I can do now and that I can do better, like aspirational. And so we took a step back and we went and we had values discussions with employees, all of these workshops. We created a half day session where we um, actually took the top eight values and the employees tried to define them in small work groups and we presented them to each other. Um, so the employees, in my experience, maybe Mark would concur with this, the leadership makes and then we start moving and then we kind of bring the employees mm -hmm. along. I would say we're all together moving, and that's been a very unique experience for me, having the employees be so incredibly engaged in this process. As it turns out, at the end of the day, the employees had so much passion for it that they actually then came back to the leadership team and said, hey, this is our recommendation. And the leadership team had a hard time finding fault with the recommendation. They presented all of their ideas, the definitions, the action statements, how they wanted to be evaluated on it. And I mean, who doesn't love it when all the employees get all the work done, right? I mean, it's been great. Um, but it has been a unique experience for me to have the employee base so engaged in a process like this. And I think that is a hats off to this organization because I just don't see it. I don't know, Mark, if you're, this has no, been a unique experience for you as well. I agree. Okay. Yeah, I think so. I think that bodes well for us as we start uh, wanting to measure different things or do different things that the employees are really plugged into this process. So our last topic is around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, so I put in the packet a little bit of background. So a lot of times you see an organization say, okay, let's really start meaningful work on this topic. And they do a search and they find a consultant and they start doing the things that we're about to recommend. Let's do a formal survey to kind of capture the status quo where we're at, the current mm -hmm. state. Let's get some action items. Let's see what we can do. Let's really dive into that. Um, little 10... Not surprising, we took a little bit different approach. You know, when you do that really formal route, it can be really time intensive. So the organization isn't feeling, seeing, or doing anything with this important topic because you're doing all this background work setting the stage. Um, you know, through my own personal experience in growth and anti racism and just learning and understanding my own bias, um, I just felt that the time was now. And Mark and I had been talking about it since, honestly, my interview with him. And so we took an organic approach where we had a strategy and a thoughtfulness to it, but we took advantage of all these organic opportunities that came along. And that's how we developed like the partner professor program, because we wanted to talk about things like what is the experience of a black person within our organization? And then we looked around and we're like, well, hey, there's no one representing that community within um, 
this group here that we want to talk about it. So we sought out people who were experts who could bring that lens to us. And so we took advantage of all these organic opportunities to just try and help our organization kind of get on the same page. Like our first class ever was uh, breaking the bias. And the whole class is about, this is the definition of bias. Let's talk about if you have some. They're not wrong or bad, they just live. And you have to understand what your own bias is to be able to move forward. And so just a gentle approach, knowing that this topic is steeped in both policy and the human heart. And that's what makes it a little bit more tricky. We see that a lot of things in uh, local government, that it's policy and people, right? I mean, that's why we're in it. So we've taken advantage over the last year. And in the packet, uh, you guys may have seen the list of things that we were able to do. We've been able to share this with some of the citizens also. Um, just a lot, a lot of things that we've done uh, through this organic process. We've had our strategy kind of in the background um, and the strategy has changed a little bit, but I think that Littleton's at a crossroads. The organic process is only gonna get us so far um, because we need some skill sets that we don't have employed here. And so I think now is the time we have this momentum with us talking about it. People are more comfortable with it because um, it can be a scary topic, but we have done it in a gentle way where employees are engaging with it, employees want it. Um, they're attending all of our classes, selling out all the classes where we have things on microaggression or bias. Uh, they're attending them in droves. So our recommendation is um, that we hire a qualified DEI consultant uh, to first conduct an interview and then do a survey. I think that the um, survey is most important at this stage of the game because it really will capture where we're at. They'll talk to employees, citizen members, council. Uh, they'll take a look at some of the things that we're doing and will let us know exactly where we stand. It's my belief um, that, you know, this topic can be scary, but we're doing a lot of things that we maybe don't even recognize. If you ever have a conversation with Nancy Trem or Tim, the work they're doing in this area in their two departments, is just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, really interactive work on their policies, uh, the way that they're approaching citizens and uh, community members. So they're kind of leading the way in this area and they're already doing a ton of the work. They're doing formal training within their professional organizations. So there's a lot happening in this topic um, that I think we just don't know that it's happening and probably things we can replicate within our other departments, best practices that we're already doing. And so a survey will help with that. And then the audit, of course, helps us to provide next steps. And we know some of these things we're already tackling. You know, Keith and his department, the ADA plan to get, you know, the physical accessibility issues squared away. We're already working on that. We know it's a problem, but we're fixing it. Um, so it, it will just be a good place for us to acknowledge the hard work we've done and then also to provide next steps forward. So the timing on this, um, I think being thoughtful to the capacity of HR um, and having um, the recruitment process for a new HR director and who that person might be, um, you know, getting an RFP together and selecting a consultant um, just added a little bit of time into that because uh, capacity issues. And then potential costs, uh, I would anticipate between twenty dollars and $50,000 for this consultant depending on how robust you want them to be. The nice thing about a project like this is you can scope it out in phases, right? Maybe the first phase is you only want to do that survey. You just want to understand where are we at. That's completely acceptable to do. Um, you can have a second phase that says let's move more into the audit. You can then continue that down to have them help you develop training, education. You know, th there's just a uh, approach that you can take that you can stair step it all the way through. So uh, you can have, be thoughtful to the finances the capacity of the organization, and then of course this policy and the human heart issue, right? Um, it is interesting. We have some employees who made meetings with uh, HR, Jacqueline and I, and they will sit down and they will say, this is too much, it's too much, Noel. Um, you hired a company and their logo said Black Lives Matter on their website and it's too much for me. And so we'll talk through that. Then we have other employees coming in and saying, you're failing, you're not doing enough. <laughs> so it is like the full spectrum and emotional and emotions and passions behind all of it. So, um, you know, my thought has always been, my goal is to move the needle even a smidge. If someone just thinks of their own life as they're writing something in code about isn't my bias about, you know, what is it? I mean, that is movement and that's sustainable and it's meaningful. So um, sweeping changes can be really scary and hard in this area. So, um, you know, a consultant can help us to take the steps where people can move with the process instead of having a process like this forced on them, which I think is ideal. I mean, we can have all the policies in the world, but if people are scared to interact with them or don't believe in them or don't understand them, what's the point of the policy? So um, that is our 
our recommendation. Mark, was there anything that you think I'm missing or that you would? Well, I think I'd emphasize that just, you know, a lot of the good work we've done here. And I think with um, a new HR director and a new city manager, I do think it's probably most appropriate that we bring somebody in and do kind of a phased assessment. I do like the idea of structuring this so there's kind of multiple phases. We start with something small, report out to new HR director, city manager, and the council. Let's see what that tells us. We have in the contract ready to take the next step if that's what we feel is necessary. Um, I think there's a lot of things we could do, but I think it is important <coughs> to your point here. We don't want to force an outcome here. I think that that, in my opinion, would be the very worst thing we could do. And so I think we just need to be sensitive to, to this issue and try to figure out a strategy that fits us. When, when you say force an outcome, what do you mean? You know, I, I've seen a lot of programs that are you know pretty robust about it, and they just have all employees train over this issue immediately. Well, I think it doesn't necessarily uh, recognize where some of the people come from, the different types of people you have in work groups, whether it's public works or police or HR or finance. We just all come from with a different perspective. And so I think I would refrain from doing that. I would be much more cautious about what's the strategy and how we bring all of us along here. Because otherwise, you're going to have people push back. That's my fear. I think you have to be thoughtful as well, um, because you could see a rise in the opposite behavior than what you want through employee relations. Um, so if we're, you know, want to be thoughtful to those things um, and help people understand. Uh, so for me, like, I think a great class would be um, looking at the scientific uh, data points of all the studies that have been done that says why inclusion is better than not having inclusion. I mean, if you want to be a profitable organization, you will have a wide range of gender, nationalities, um, LGBTQIA people in there, uh, in that community. You will have all of these folks working for you. We know the most highest grossing <clears throat> employers are diverse. And so what does that mean for local government? What is the benefit of saying not everyone looks like me? Because there is benefit to that. So let's really start talking about why diversity matters and how it can be impactful to the work that we're doing. Most importantly, our, our community members. So, um, you know, you can have people like Mark say, take a class that basically, you know, will make people feel like, oh gosh, if I'm white, I'm obviously horrible. No, that is not uh, the message that we want to send because that's not the truth of the matter. So helping people to all like, hey, we all agree what bias is. We all agree on that definition. Well, now it's much easier to talk about that because we all agree to a definition. And so moving in that uh, more thoughtful process, um, I, I think creates lasting change. I would agree with Mark. Yeah, they, I mean, this is a great update. I'm glad to see everything that's going on there. There's been a lot, a lot done and yeah. definitely keep up the momentum. I think that's important. And so, yeah, I'm supportive of the recommendation and moving right. forward. I think it's real important. Adds to the, you know, the robustness of the organization and the culture we're trying to create. So, right. yeah. Has this already been part of the budget that's been approved? No, it has not. <clears throat> so this is an addition? Correct. This would be something that would be considered here for this. Well, I guess we could start it here this year if we wanted to, but, um, you know, we'd put it into the budget process normally here for us to kind of take on. So this will be for the fall? I, I think we, my suggestion was is that we probably should look to the fall. The reason I say that is because we've got a new HR director that's going to take several months to get on board. It's going to, you know, hopefully the new city manager is quick here. And uh, so I think you, those are the two key people that really need to be on board uh, to really kind of move this issue forward. You can't really do it. You, you could try to do it sooner, but in the end, you really got to have those people get their fingerprints on this thing, my opinion. In the packet, you'll see that uh, if you wait for the budget process on this, we're still doing our organic approach. So, which, which packet are you referring to? Because I didn't, all I got was the slides. Um, yeah, is our packet was pulled. Was there, like, was yeah, was was there another one in there? Yeah. yeah, that's where I didn't get it in there. There's like a memo. Let's see here. Are you about staff communication? You know what? Yeah, staff yeah. communication. It, it didn't come across the legislature. The staff communication did? Nope, oh, thank you. Oh, and the, oh, and the uh, staff report you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, it's in the communication. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry, okay. Jerry. Yeah, I got the staff report. Yeah, it was in there. One thing I wanted to Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. That I picked yeah. up in that staff communication that you wrote was 
you've done so much just in the last 15 months alone. And during a, during, doing it during a pandemic, I think, is amazing. I mean, that is a tremendous accomplishment. Um, the classes for employees, I mean, you said it earlier, they want more. And we were just talking about kind of we created this culture around values. And so I think if we want to build that trust with our, our community, which is our staff, and our community of Littleton, like they are asking for that, like they are asking for more classes, more training, more understanding, more common language. Um, I also think the emphasis on supporting all types of families, like with the insurance review and a medical plan, I think that's amazing because we don't want to just focus on nuclear families, right? It's single parents, it's, um, you know, et cetera. Um, I also love that we're focusing on hiring bilingual folks. Anything that's going to increase our ability to communicate with our community, I'm fully supportive of, and I love that that's, you know, an emphasis. Um, I want a DEI audit. I do want that. I want a plan. I want that survey especially. I think a survey is going to give us data. And I know a lot of us here really like the data. We like to look at the facts. So let's listen to what our employees and our staff and maybe even members of our community are telling us so that we can better inform our policy decisions. Uh, Pam, to your point, uh, yeah, I think it's going to cost money. Um, and of course, I think that can make some of us who've had reservations in the past about spend, 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 um, think twice about it, and that is part of our job. I do think it's a long-term investment in our future. I think it will pay for itself. You know, Council Member Grove and I, we attended the South Metro Denver Chamber, so the business people, they hosted an event on diversity, equity, inclusion, and business in the Denver metro area, and they said one of the things that, you know, folks... We want to attract people who are diverse because we know that's going to create a robust, healthy community. Well, those folks who are diverse, they're looking for things like a plan. They're looking for a survey. They're looking to see our words and our actions align and match. They look on a website. They look in press releases to see is, hey, have they act, you know, they put this in their goals. Is this in their goal? Is this in the vision? Is it, and, you know, inclusion is now one of the values. Like, I love that. And I, I think having like a formalized, pulling all of this together, and if, even if it's a phased approach, great. Somewhere we can pull it all together um, so that we can attract that, I think, is going to not only increase um, our community here in Lake Littleton, but also, like, grow our business, our business footprint, you know, making it more diverse and, you know, preparing us for the future, I think. So I fully support that. The one thing that we don't really talk about on this topic is the risk mitigation um, that comes from this, right? So the city attorney could talk about when an employee files uh, discrimination claims and the cost that are associated with that, especially if they're proven. Um, you know, there are some grants um, from the federal government that will look to see if you've had any EEOC um, things like this, and if you have, it makes it more difficult to get grants. So there are some practical business applications along with what we want for our community um, in terms of risk mitigation uh, that go along with this topic as well. I agree with what uh, Gretchen said, and I was just very impressed with the breadth and depth of what you've done that I guess I wasn't aware of. Um, and I don't know if council that can be included in some of these appropriate trainings or that if they're modularized that we can maybe we don't belong in the meetings with the employees, but if we could um, have some exposure to some of these things, we'd be great. Based on what Mark's saying, though, I would advocate that um, we wait till the next budget cycle and move on with the organic stuff, get these key people hired. A little bit of sticker shock from our hiring seven headcount with our programs that we offered and didn't realize that the headcount would have to be associated with. So I'd like to think about doing this for next budget cycle. So, and that package, that was in the next item agenda. It wasn't in the, this uh, item. That's where I, was, where I couldn't find it. Oh, okay. Yeah, when you kept saying the, the packet, I'm like, there is no packet. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Wrong term. <laughs> for all the times I present, like, four, right? <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> I got it messed up. It's time for you to go. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see my She's lady. Yeah. Yes. Head north, lady. Attention <laughs> didn't work out. That's right. right. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. 100%. You've done so, so much in such a short period of time and thoroughly and totally impressed. Um, the inclusion committee, that's pretty interesting with employees. So that's this, we have that at our hospital <clears throat> too as well, and it's fantastic. People were clamoring to get on this committee. It's so fantastic. And you said um, you're going to invite one to two members of the public to attend. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that they would have to apply and right. go through that whole yeah, process. Figuring that process out, yep. And I think it's great that you're including the the next gen advisory board. I think that's really key. 
um, because they are the youth of the community, and I think that they definitely should be involved in the comment and the communication. I agree with Pam. I would love to go to some of these um, these trainings. Yeah, you know, Mark and I have had conversations about what would be appropriate for boards and commission. Is there a way to you know weave some of these trainings in, um, you know, to um, other employee types uh, beyond just the regular status employees. So we've had quite a few conversations, but we've not landed on a spot yet, but it's on our radar, certainly. And I, you know, of, of course, I agree on hiring the consultant, and I would um, I would be in favor of moving faster, um, depending on when the city manager is hired and then the new HR um, director. But um, to keep this momentum and this train moving forward, oh, yeah, for sure. I do have a question, though, for you. What is, uh, you got positive feedback from your employees. Chef's kiss. What's the chef's kiss? Oh, yeah. Perfect. Oh. 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 It's like actual quote. Who's, who's the oh, came from the culinary city expert? Office. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've never heard that either. Yes, I did have that question. Go he needs to go to some training, I think. So, Amazing job. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for investing in the long term health of this organization. Yeah, I mean, the key part of this, so thank you. Any other, any other uh, comments, Steve? I, you know, wanted to say too, I appreciate the work that you guys have done, and I agree that like a slow and, and kind of continuous sea change of having these ongoing trainings and educational <laughs> opportunities is fantastic. Um, I'm really interested in seeing what kinds of policies uh, that, you know, where there is potential for policies and what you guys may have come up with your review internally mm -hmm. as well to, to direct the consultant. Because, you know, I agree that having a survey and an audit of current practices is, is really important. Um, and I think the ongoing training and education is something to stay. But also I think people can grapple with these things when they see a very tangible change in a city policy like a maternity or paternity leave policy or a medical uh, benefits change mm -hmm. is very tangible and real. I think that also um, quite honestly keeps us in the game, you know, going back to your early part of the presentation on employee retention because right. a lot of employees are looking for these things. So I, I would say, you know, in the process of formulating an RFP to, uh, you know, have at least some policy directed outcomes and Agreed. kind of quick wins as something that's very visible for the employees as Agreed. part of that scope. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm in support of it. I do think as well that having a city manager and HR director mm -hmm. on board to help shape and craft that RFP yep. uh, to give some insight there is, is important. Um, so, but, you know, keep on, keep it on in the meantime. I will say that we, um, you know, the health insurance piece and some of those things that we're doing in the background, our goal, our strategic goal in our organic process was to not provide bait and switch to employees. So should someone come along and say, they're saying this language and then they opt into our health insurance and be like, oh, none of what I need is covered because I am trans or whatever it might be, that we're building the infrastructure to support what we want to start saying so no one feels it's a bait and switch. And we actually, through Aon, which is one of the largest uh, benefits consultant worked with Cigna and we received the highest rating and in being inclusive with our health benefits. So that was a huge yeah. feather in our cap. I should have included it in our, yeah, that's not the packet of. in the communication. Yeah, we were leading the way. We were <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That. yeah. So that's been exciting. Uh, Carrot, which is about family planning of all types of family, including, um, you know, uh, being able to freeze your eggs to have family down the road if you want to be able to prepare for that has been really successful. Um, I think that that's the program um, more frequently than anything else that people have called and said I felt seen I struggled with infertility I had to go out of the country to get help I can't believe the city is doing this this is I'll never leave because I mean and it's just seeing people as people so it's been a really really great outcome we uh, did it in a road show and we actually had people speak up during the road show to you know 100 other employees to say this is fantastic so we got some wins in there I might be more inclined to Again, I love how much I love consultants, but twenty to fifty grand for this type of is is pretty robust. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would say let's maybe focus on hiring that person, that that full time employee that can do this for us and and be at center stage. I, you know, again, I think I I just see us spending, spending, spending. In fact, what Pam says, you know, I'd definitely like to see this go on next year's budget, not not this year. We right. already set this year's budget, so. Um, you know, that's just my you know, 
might be best to maybe look at killing two birds with one stone. Great. Thank I like you. That idea too. Yeah, I plan to do that. That's a really great idea. Yeah, staff better than consultants. Yeah. Sorry, consultants in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if, you, if you get a, a staff person, you have to look at another what third for uh, overhead. So it's, yeah. I mean, if we're truly going down that road, right? Yeah, I mean, but if we're going to be spending an ongoing thing on this, then maybe that makes sense. It's just um, like Noel said, it's, you know, just because this is you know, three months down the road or whatever. It, we're, they're not stopping what they're doing. They're still, right. and Jacqueline's can, and Teddy are going to continue this momentum you've got going. As well, I, mean, what I we're think it's crucial to get the city manager and HR yeah. person yeah. Yeah. before yeah. we move forward on this. When it, the time comes, maybe option consultant versus. Sure, yeah. That would be a great thing to look at. I can make sure we set that expectation for my successor. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll leave a little note in the drawer, kind of like the president's <laughs> <laughs> sticky notes. Good luck. <laughs> uh, all the R's keys will be missing. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Good direction. Great. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you, you. Thank you for everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Very much pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to be a leader again. Uh, I'm not going to complain, but I have not gotten an ovation. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we know. Put it in your journal. <laughs> All right, so uh, next up on the agenda, we got some procurement discussions. Oh, my God. We'll change in the guard here. Are we going to take a five-minute break? You want to take a five-minute break? Yeah. All right, we'll take a, we'll take a short break then.
Okay. All right, let's rock and roll on the, the procurement policies. Turn to Mark. Yeah, um, so Noel set the bar. <laughs> you hopefully will get a uh, standing ovation here. I've been here 19 years. I have yet to get a standing yeah, Oh, well, then we can just. <laughs> 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 I'm not standing. <laughs> Every meeting, every yeah. 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 Not that retention. Let the record show Valdez did not stay. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta earn it, dude. Oh, that's rough. That's right. Get out of here. <laughs> well, let's see. This this is um, for some. This may not necessarily be the most exciting topic, but for those of us in the organization who live this every day. This so is, passionate about it. This is kind of our bread and butter. <laughs> I mean, this is once the council obviously sets the direction, your goals, then we go out and execute that. And so many times it ends up in procurement. And I'm not sure if Dave, we'll make some introductions Yes, here, yes, we will. Yeah, so um, we have reinvented a lot of this here to the fullest extent possible, but we got some real hamstrung issues here with both our code and our charter. And so this is an opportunity for us to kind of brief you on that. And I know as the council later this summer will consider a possible charter amendment, so we'll talk about that. But we, again, do have some code issues that relate to this thing as well. So, fascinating topic. I'm setting the stage for you guys. Hopefully. Right, get ready. <laughs> okay, Ashley, go ahead. Well, please. thank you, Cancel. I'm Ashley Bolton, Admin Services Director, and Tiffany Hooten, our Finance Director, I know you know. But we'd like to also introduce you to Dave Ems, who is our Procurement Officer. Yeah! Yeah! Jerry, <laughs> saw leadership not to break us. <laughs> so, grandstand. <laughs> so, just ignore the city attorney. All right, there we go. Dave joined our organization actually about two and a half years ago. I had a posting for an IT management analyst. And bless his heart, he saw the word procurement buried in the job description and said, hey, this looks interesting. And it intrigued him. We got a conversation going, found that we knew similar people. The rest was really history. Um, I'd love to give Dave just a quick opportunity to tell a little bit about himself. Um, sure. Be glad to. Um, grew up in Littleton, Columbine High School graduate. Yes, they had a high school back then. You know that's not Littleton, right? I'm going to go right now. I'm sorry. I'm mad at me every time somebody says something like that. Jeff, a little. He's <laughs> kind of close. Pretty close. Cool. Yeah. Continue. Yeah. You're for one of the fun. It makes me sorry I, I, I applauded you now. <laughs> um, director of sponsored programs for University of Denver, along with special services, including real estate and <coughs> facilities and rebuilding buildings. For a lot of donors, so that was a lot of work around there. Got an MBA in finance and accounting. Most recently, I worked at Western Union and first date as a VP of global sourcing. One of my more enjoyable jobs was Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, created two companies, Charter Communications and a company called High Speed Access. And we had to figure out, it seems not that long ago, but 2001, how to bring internet to the homes and procure it. So that was one of my more enjoyable positions, that one. Cool. I'm happy to be here. It's an exciting opportunity. I like to just squeeze money if I can and let you guys figure out what to do with it. Everyone in this organization jokes that when they're going to buy a new car, they want Dave to come with them. So <laughs> he's done an amazing job. Married with four kids, too, so I've got to get that in. And his sister works across the street at the county. Um, so we'll dive right into our agenda. We just wanted to give you a little background on what we've been working on over the past two years. Uh, since we actually for formalized this procurement division and hired Dave to help us run it. Uh, talk about our 2022 plans initiatives and then dive right into the current state and constraints that are preventing us from executing on those plans and initiatives as efficiently and effectively as we would like. Also, we'd like to talk a little about the comparisons. We went into detail in the council communication on some of what other cities are doing around us. So we wanted to touch on some highlights there then jump into the recommendations, talk about council direction that we're seeking from you, and next steps. So real quick, 
And we formed this division actually uh, at the same time when we formed admin services. It really gave us, I think, the perfect opportunity to actually carve it out. And Tiffany and I worked together, I think, for many, many months, if not probably years, <laughs> in terms of thinking about what we really wanted this div division to be. And I think Dave will talk about the key priorities um, that I think we really focused on, but it really was the three of us working together in terms of what did we what did we want this to be? How did we want to bring this to our fellow department heads and employees? And what benefits could we could we bring to them? So, want to start off? I sure will. Thank you. The first one we're going to talk about background and accomplishments. This one dates us a little bit, going back to the COVID days. I had to look this week and figure out when did we first get our first N95 masks? It was April 5th of 2020, so pretty pretty early on. And in April of 2020, I got a call from Dell because we had just received our large quantity of Dell laptops, and we were the first municipality they were aware of that got their laptops in when remote work became a big issue. So thanks to Ashley and Tiffany for planning their uh, renewals of Dell laptops and hardware, PC refresh as we call it. Um, so by, by having those in hand, we were able to adapt real quick. We also purchased 3,195 masks with the help of the PD, direct from 3M for 92 cents a piece. And there were, those arrived in 2020 and are still here today. Um, we've created many on-call contracts, and we have contracts in place with cooperative purchasing agreements that we can use. These agreements are done beforehand and allow us to quickly give work to a vendor on a project basis rather than going through a sourcing cycle of 60 days to pick a vendor. It's just already in existence. And this is really critical for Keith's group in particular, when they've got an emergency and need something taken care of immediately. We have these call on-call contracts in place so can execute immediately when safety or other time factors are considerations. Yeah, for Keith, we did the Bemis roof replacement and a farm project to upgrade the electrical out there. Um, we also have sole source justification process where we can go when there's only one supplier or one product that can meet your need. And we've written them in several cases. One was for the PD, for the Axon Body Worn Cameras, I'm sure you're aware of, uh, PD, PD's Mobile Command Center. They're the only vendor that could provide the chassis that we needed within 18 months, let alone two years. Um, and respirators and gas masks, Chief is over there. And they're only available from one source, and here's why. All the police departments in South Metro Denver want to utilize these gas masks, should it be a big incident. There's no learning curve. Everybody uses the same mask. So we didn't go off and bid this. We needed a very specific product. So that's why we did that one. Um, turning to 2020 negotiated savings. Since then, about $760,000 in savings. I went back and looked about half of that as ARPA money. So I had to tell Tiff, Tiffany and Ashley, please don't expect that every year. <laughs> um, but we do have some really good savings today at 107000 in 2022. I'll share just a few examples. And we're going to go back to Chief Stevens, who's here. The Axon body-worn cameras and tasers were $52,000 less than the state contract for cooperative purchasing agreements, which is awesome. Uh, we had, had another save. You guys were aware of the PD's mobile command center. I'm sure you all approved that. We had a negotiated save of 34000 I got challenges to get that under what you approved, and we were able to do that. And then Mark and Ashley got me involved in host compliance monitoring for short-term rentals like Airbnb, Thank you, Dave. And VRBO. <laughs> and they said, well, let's just pick all these sweet offerings they have. Just, she said, my boss, well, Dave tried to get 50%. Very luckily, we got it. So that was 9700 And Tiffany's really good about throwing invoices over the fence. And, and when she threw our way, actually, it was a $10,000 cost reduction from last year. It was for Sage Benefits Messenger. It has in a very high pricing tier for the size of the city that we are. So we have a savings from that. Before you move on, uh, that S tier compliance, we have that in place. <coughs> Post compliance, we are working on implementing it right now. Jen Henninger's team is taking a lead on that and working with Tiffany's group as well. So we're trying to see, yeah, the cost benefit of Dave got us a fantastic deal to kick the tires on, get it up and running. We actually were able to get the full suite of modules to see which ones may really provide a benefit. I think one of the ones we were really interested in was the kind of investigation arm where it could actually go out there and help us kind of scan all the different websites and identify folks that weren't in compliance and hadn't registered with us. So we want to see how well it works before we renew it next year. But Jen Henninger seems in the process of implementing it. That's wonderful. That's fabulous. Thank you. Sure. 
So now we're turning quickly. Oh, and real quick, just on this, I think, I know this is very hard to read, but I think what we wanted to show and illustrate was Dave started out in IT, but when we created admin services, put him in a position to be procurement officer for the entire city. And he's done just a fantastic job with really trying to get reach out there and work with all of our departments across the city. That's why it's a fine job to get a lot of visibility. You know, it's not a large corporation buying pencils all day. So I appreciate the breath. <laughs> so you're more than just charts. Those aren't yes. my charts. <laughs> <laughs> I like to hunt for the gold and throw it over the fence and let somebody else add it up. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather be the miner. So here we're going into an interesting one for 2022. Plans and initiatives. Continuity of supply in a seller's market. I don't need to tell you it's getting more and more difficult to find vendors due to supply. And of course, the prices are going up and up. I want to give you just two quick examples. We have one with uh, an RFP out right now for our water resource master plan for a consultant. 20 year project, help us figure out how to conserve water, ensure that we have water in 20 years. Reached out to one vendor last week and wanted specifically them to be included in the proposal. And they wrote back, given our current commitments, we're unfortunately won't be able to respond to this RFP. We're starting to see that. The next one is last year we had five bidders bid on replacing our sewer lines. This year we had one vendor bid, and that bid on a per foot basis is 37% higher. Public Works can't accept it. It's supposed to be low price, but we had to cancel all bids, reprice it, get budget approval for the revised scope. So that's another example. Later on we'll be talking about some recommendations, I think, that will help ensure what I call continuity of supply. That's really a supply chain term, but that just means vendors are, are going to be here. Ashley, do you want to talk yeah. about the ERP? The next one I think we really wanted to talk about was accelerating again what we're calling the digital transformation. I know you guys are probably getting sick and tired of hearing about this, but we still have a lot that is paper-based. And particularly in the procurement area, we do a lot after the fact. We use purchase orders like pretty religiously in, in public works when we're dealing with our development projects and such. But the rest of the purchasing that we do across the city, it really is not proactive. And where we lose out in that is that we're not really aware of our spend until the invoice comes in after something has been bought. And trying to use the ERP to get more proactive and use what we call requisitions, which really means I'm just requesting to buy something up front. We get the approval up front. We make sure we have the money up front before we buy something. We're able to properly categorize what we're buying so we can track more, more detail around after the fact how different categories of goods and services are actually trending cost-wise. Um, we're hoping to do that up front. It also, again, will give us that visibility to the funds that we've encumbered so that we know, again, what we've spent and have more real-time data on where we are. And Tiffany knows more than anybody. Right now, we're typically six, at least six weeks behind in terms of where our actuals are. And shifting the focus to make things more digital upfront using the ERP, it's going to be a huge change management curve, again, for our employees who are used to doing everything after the fact. Uh, but we're going to be working on that as part of the ERP project to really get the education out there get people to understand how, hey, we're just shifting the work up front instead of later on, and also getting all of our managers and leaders on board to really understand the benefits of having this data up front and how that can help them. I think in addition to that, one of the things we were struggling with was, again, just trying to, again, look at the trends of what we've been spending and where it's, where it's been spent, and we just don't have a good grasp on that data today, given that it's been more reactive. And so, again, this digital transformation again, will really help us try to see also more where we're spending, give Tiffany more flexibility in terms of, I think, managing our budget more timely throughout the year versus what it seems like we do right now is we get to December and then, oh, my gosh, okay, we do have this money. Well, what can we go out and use it for? We can do that throughout the year with this more digital, proactive focus around our purchasing. So you're saying that six-week delay or is because it's not been booked until the invoice comes in? So there's that, but also our P card, how we have it in such a way right now, it doesn't integrate with our general ledger. And it's a very manual process that has to go through these approvals and then ultimately get booked by Tiffany's team after all of these things are done. The ERP will allow us to actually do that real time and have our transactions booked to the GL pretty so much within. The P card is by department? It, uh, well, it's, it's, our, it's the card that we, it's basically yeah, our credit card. Like a, and, right. Correct. 
And so specific people in each department have. So by the time they turn paperwork in, you know, already lost a week or two. And, and just the timing in terms of how the statement closes, we have to wait for the statement to close, then wait for everybody to review their transactions, upload their receipts, approve them. That adds more weeks on to it. And then it takes Tiffany's team a manual process to actually get that information booked up into our general ledger so that we so as department five, heads yeah. finally see but This is the why we don't stand sometimes when we It's not her fault. It's not her fault. You know, Ashley talks about the ERP, and, you know, we, we just have a limited system right now. And we've done the best we can working around some of those limitations, but an ERP is really going to allow us the ability to to get real-time re live data in our system immediately so we don't have to wait these, you know, four weeks, six weeks to get it posted to more the efficient. GM. Much more, more efficient. efficient, yeah. And, you know, the other piece of it is the, the purchase order process. So our current system that we have is, again, limited. Um, it's not robust in purchase orders whatsoever. And so we just haven't taken advantage of the system um, as fully or, or how we want to. Um, we kid about a penny, but literally when you enter a purchase order, you have to enter quantities by pennies <laughs> because the way the system is configured and we cannot change that. And so we are, have been very hesitant in using the purchase orders to the full advantage. And so a new ERP is, uh, the purchase order is gonna start the process. Right now it's kind of after the fact essentially. It'll actually start the full purchasing process like it should be. Um, it, in the beginning at the uh, start of a project um, so that we have that throughout the entire process. And so, so instead of the encumbered, that it's, I mean, it's already encumbered, but you don't even know it's been drawn from until weeks later. Exactly. A, yes, yep. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then we can do the approvals up front so that we can set that purchase order approval to say, hey, your employee wants to buy this. Do you approve this? You approve it up here. When the invoice <coughs> comes in later, there's an automated process that will match the quantity, dollar amount, vendor. And if they're equal, you already approved it. So we're going to automatically improve it. And again, the work is already done. With the PO number? Or? So the PO will match to the invoice. And if everything checks out, dollar amount, quantity, vendor, we'll approve the invoice. But you know your encumbered amount is less now at this point because you've already committed. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So a similar process. It's just going to streamline it and make it more efficient for for the end users. And move it up yeah. so that we know sooner than later. Right. Um, and then Tiff, I think you were going to talk yeah. about. Um, so, you know, the whole idea is to build this citywide alignment towards best value and best practices. You know, we, we have that in our policy currently. We strive to, to meet those goals. We just have some inherent limitations that we want to talk to you about this evening. We also have to ensure compliance with legal and regulatory requirements. Uh, we are subject to single audits um, in 2023 because of the federal funding that we've gotten. There are some strict purchasing guidelines that are related to that, and we want to make sure we have the processes in place and that everybody understands what those processes are citywide. Um, Dave and his group, definitely going to be the source of uh, information for departments, but we need to have that in place and um, the best that we can. Reduce spend. You know, one thing that Dave does really well is negotiating prices. So we value that because that means we have more money as a department to be able to utilize that in another area potentially. And so being able to really negotiate prices with vendors and reduce our spend in, in that regard. And then deliver strategic procurement value. And uh, Dave can probably speak to that a little bit more, um, but just, you know, enhancing the process, making sure that we're meeting our requirements, best value, best practice. We always want to, to, to lean on those best practices for purchasing. And we just have some limitations. That but how much of our procurement is going through, what is it, government services? Uh, like uh, GSA yes. services yeah. or cooperative agreements? Yes. Um, I don't know if we have a, a, a percentage. Do you? Do I would you? say about 3% of our overall number of contracts. <coughs> was that all? It is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But you know, that's, that, that's not necessarily dollars. That's just percent. The percent of contracts. Yeah. Okay. yeah. For purchases. Oh, oh. Okay. Activity. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. You know, cooperative agreements are fairly new to Littleton. We really didn't start uh, utilizing these and, and taking advantage of these until most recently. I think the first one, first one we did at the city was related to coffee machines. I mean, um, as simple as a coffee machine. But we have really reached out and we have, there's a lot of resources in other states, other cities, other counties, 
that we can really tap into uh, to utilize those cooperative agreements. You know, letting them do the work for us. Yeah, let's let them do the work for us. They get the best value. They follow procurement policy. As long as it aligns with us, then we can certainly tap into them can, and, and use them. Can you understand. explain what a cooperative purchasing agreement is for some of us? Yeah. Sure will. It's where, <laughs> it's where um, SourceWell is a federal agency or group called SourceWell. And cooperative purchasing agreements were started by small municipalities banding together to get pricing discounts and bulk discounts. Um, there is one we have now with a company called Gordian. Gordian has $2.7 billion in revenue. They have over 4,000 line items, like if you need electrical engineer, grade three, five hours. It's a fixed price. In Colorado, there's a table. And we can contract for that right now. We did it to build an enclosure at the courthouse and revamp all the electrical in, at the farm. So there's no bidding there. The rates were good and we could go with them. So we look forward to utilizing that. Because Keith does need that quick solution in place to get those contracts done. But essentially these groups have banded together and have gone out and negotiated the prices already mm -hmm. so that we don't have to do it ourselves and we can piggyback on their already negotiated prices. And only 3% of our contracts are going through there. Just started. Wow. Yeah. It's definitely an opportunity that we yeah, need to see. Say so. And one of the actual code changes that we want to talk with you guys about tonight that is prohibiting yeah, us from so. using some of the cooperative agreements that are out there. Yeah, I'd say a lot of the cooperative purchasing agreements are for a five-year term. And one of the code provisions that you'll see that we have is we're allowed to utilize agreements that have only been made within the past two years. So there's some that one year, is it one? So there's some that we just actually can't use that pricing. So it obviously leads to a burden on us as we have to try to secure our own pricing as opposed to just using something where another governmental entity or another participant has already secured the terms, already secured the pricing, and just utilize that. So Is that where we're getting our blank purchase purchases from? No. Wh which purchases? Blanket purchases agreements. So we're going doing it through that? Blanket purchases we view as differently, like we might have a blanket order with a company for product and services throughout the year of supplies, but it's a little bit different than co-op. Okay. You know, we could get contracts like Chief Stevens' Axon contract. If we do a really good agreement with Reed and we put it all together, that can become now available to other entities. Yeah. Other that they can piggyback off of us yeah. now. Right. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So I'd like to jump in if I can. One thing, quick thing I wanted to remind you may everyone, not. <laughs> just that... Also, too, it was on the previous slide, but everything that we're trying to do really ties into council rule number two and number three, which is our financial sustainability and innovative infrastructure. So just wanted to remind you that there's that underlying theme, everything that we're talking about. Yeah, so the next three or four slides are basically, what are our rules today in a simplified view? How do we compare with other cities, our size, in our region? And then what are our recommendations? So first off, you'll see, I see on this chart, the $5,000 and $10,000 figures represent at what purchase amount <coughs> you're required to go and get a bid? Wired. Five laptops total $11,000, <coughs> whatever it might be. That's the amount we have to go and get a bid. Um, if we're procuring a capital asset or contracting for capital improvement project, we must go out to bid if it's $5,000. If it's for supplies, materials, or equipment, we have to go out to bid if it's over $10,000. Now, when we think about both of those categories, capital, Supplies, equipment, and um, service um, materials. Thank you. All of those are now subject to the lowest price. So if I asked all of you to sell me a lawnmower, you, we would get an envelope from you. It would be a sealed bid in an envelope, and you could come and open it up at the bid opening and realize who won. And that's how it is today in our charter and code. Um, and it might not be the best quality. Absolutely. Just the but price. our charter says the lowest and best value. It says lowest So it doesn't best. mean we're taking the cheapest best bid. It says thing. best bid. Is it bid? It says best oh, bid. It said value, okay. We, we, we hope it says value. That's, That's what we're, we're, That's what we're we hoping want. to clarify yeah. right. and change the language. Yeah. <clears throat> because there, there's a lot of factors that go into something other than just lowest cost, you know. Absolutely. Whether or not they're local whether or not they can provide it to us in a timely manner, the level of you know quality in terms of the good that we're receiving, Expertise. references, the ability for them to actually perform the work in, in a good way in other locations. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that outside of just lowest That's price. So. You don't want to accept my $5 uh, lawnmower, the best lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> 
that one, I'll get you five dollars. Unless it's part of the health plan. <laughs> <laughs> but that wouldn't meet your statement of work anyway. So you know, it's a garbage very long for Very interesting question. Yeah. Um, I'd like to give an example down the road. We have also services, don't have to go up for bid. So again, if we're hiring somebody to help with a downtown improvement district, that's a service with Brad at Puma, we don't have to go up for bid for that. Same for the recent, I think you approved it last week, the Open Space Trails Recreation Master Plan. We're going to RFP it because it makes sense to RFP it, but we don't have to. Um, and currently we must go out to, count, to council for approval on any contract longer than two years. Um, from my perspective, the original charter from 1959 and the code changes from 1994 hinder our ability to do best value procurement and ensure the most efficient use of taxpayer dollars. And I think Tiffany might have an example or two. Please. Yeah, um, it, this is a very simple example, but um, it's 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 live. It's what happened, and we had to deal with it just based on our constraints and our purchasing policy. Um, so we, you know, we have a tent that we go out and put up for events throughout the city year over year over year. We really needed to replace that tent. Um, sounds very simple, right? Go out, find a vendor, get a quote, uh, purchase that tent. But because of the constraints of the $5,000 limit, um, we had to go out for an RFP or a bid for that capital asset. We had an idea of how much it was going to cost, and it just happened to be more than $5,000 less than 10, um, but it's still considered a capital asset because it, its life is more than five years and it's more than $1,000. And that's kind of how we define a capital asset. So what, what we had to do is we had to draw up an RFP or a bid for this particular tent. We had to put it out in RMEPS, which is the system that we use that is um, mm -hmm. all vendors are, a lot of vendors are members of. And we had to allow time for vendors to re respond. And lo and behold, we didn't get any response um, because it was so specific for a tent, but it was a capital item, so it was, it, we were required to go out for a bid. So what we ended up having to do is this process ended up taking about three to four months because we had to draw up the bid. Oh we had to go through the process. We had to open the bid. We found out we didn't have any bids, and then what do we do? So we had to make an exception. We have the ability to make an exception. We didn't get any bids. And so it's just a process like that that, had we had a higher threshold, we could have easily gone out to a vendor, gotten quotes, which we recommend from a procurement standpoint. We recommend you get quotes. If you want to RFP it, even on services, we recommend that as well. But a simple example of how constraining our limitations are right now. Um, a $7,500 tent cost us 60 hours of staff time, uh, not to mention that uh, it delayed us purchasing the item, and we didn't get it as soon as we needed it. If I were to cut to the chase, I, I don't think you're getting an argument out of anybody. I don't think so. I don't. Yeah. yeah, I just think it's a good example of yeah. the limitations uh, of things that we have to, to manage. Yeah, absolutely. Manage. Totally understandable. Good. Why has it this been updated since 1959? Yeah, I don't get it. it. <laughs> <laughs> because we're well, waiting for you. I was not updated. We're waiting Seven. for the perfect council to. <laughs> I mean, well, I honestly think it took Dave coming in and truly having the procurement focus that we have today to really bring this to light and Thank crack you. the whips. So I think it's really important to Jerry's question because I think here's the dilemma: we could say, "I need a bid for a 50-inch HD TV, smart TV." Okay, and you get them. You get them from brands you recognize. And one comes in and it's from, you see it once in a while at Costco, you don't recognize the key name. So we redo it, right? We don't like that. We don't know that brand. So then we go out and say, okay, we need bids. We're going to buy eight Sony TVs. We need to get bids because they're available from more than one source. But Sony, though, you would have to single source because you're calling out a brand. Well, it, it's iffy because there's it's available through many different locations. So I, I think I would ask read the, the question, but I would believe we would have to print out the bid. And they would say, just buy it off our site. We're Amazon, we're Dell, we're Sony, we're B and G Electronics, Crutchfield, just buy it. So that's kind of a dilemma. I'd like to jump back to comparisons. I appreciate your question for 1959. We'll see how we stack up. So we reviewed and compared procurement policies for 17 home ruled cities in Colorado. Littleton by far has the oldest procurement regulations dating back. 1959. We're first in something. 
at an earlier chart, you saw a house costing $12,000 and our threshold was five. So the threshold was a good chunk of the average home. Mm -hmm. I don't think 5,000 is a good chunk of the average home today. All of the cities have updated their policies <coughs> between 2001 and 2019. And that's a quite a span. And the ones more recently have certainly done a lot more, we'll show you. Littleton has the lowest threshold amounts for, for capital and for supplies, materials, and equipment of any city. And comparatively, other cities have them between 25,000 and 100,000. Littleton is the only city that limits contract length. And Littleton is one of four cities that must accept the lowest price. <clears throat> some of those cities, I think, are in the process of looking at some of those changes. What would be a normal, normal contract length that you would like? Three years, five years? I, I think a good example that we faced a lot, and I know we've come to council um, for some of the resolutions, was around software. So for example, we're going out and we're investing all this money to put in a new ERP. Are we going to go and change that ERP in two years? No. Chances are we're sticking with that ERP for probably at least five years, so hopefully much longer. So at least I know in the, the software arena, five years is typically pretty standard. And I think what others are are looking at doing. I don't know if you've got more examples on the public work no, side. I do. I don't know if we can go to the next slide. I can that helps. Run. Oh, okay. we don't have the details in there. <coughs> I do. Oh. I'm good to go. OK. Um, so we're asking council to consider the changes. I appreciate your support so far to the charter and code. We believe these changes are in direct alignment with your council goals, of our council goals, of financial sustainability, and innovative infrastructure. I'd like to give you some examples. Um, first off, we're asking you to do these supports and some changes. One, recommending the competitive threshold up to 100,000, no matter what category it's in. Keep services as is. Second, enable the award of a contract based on best value. There might be a time we'll go and we'll do lowest price. There might be a need for that. But please enable us to do what we described, locality, quality, service, best value. And we'd like to be more responsive with a, I'm sorry, to select the contract term that's in the best value of the city. To your question, it could be a vendor offering price discounts. I'll give you price discounts for a three-year contract. Can't do it, gotta go to council on them. Four years, they look at this price. Microsoft Office, Office 365. I think we'll have it in a couple of years, I think we will. Um, what do we gain? What would we gain by doing these things if we move forward? Well, for the threshold for 100,000, we would reduce internal costs by limiting 60 to 80 hours per time spent on each bid under 100K. And we'd be way more responsive with the threshold because we'd remove four to six weeks off the time frame. Summer's here, we've got to get a contractor in place. We've got to, you know, we want to be able to work with 100 less value contracts to be able to do that. Best value procurement, what do we gain? We get to evaluate and pick the best vendors. That's what we gain. I can't pick the best vendors today. I can't honestly tell you I'm doing that um, on all procurement. No longer will we be required to accept the lowest price. We can take into account consideration many factors as we described. <coughs> what do we gain with contract terms in the best interest of the city? Price discounts and multi-year agreements and have long-term contracts in place to ensure the innovative infrastructure. You can't get there without it. We have to have that. Um, and best value procurement emphasis value over price. Best value might not be the lowest price. As Reed said, it's all the factors he discussed before. That's what we're asking you to consider. Code and charter at Littleton is kind of confusing. I think Tiffany's taking the next slide, where you see a repetitive piece of the first two bullets. But well, it's a third piece on property purchasing that we mentioned earlier. Yeah, so we have two two issues. We have charter issues and we have code issues. Um, we can easily change the code by ordinance with council. So we are asking um, for a couple of code changes as well. Um, again, the threshold is in the code, and so uh, we would address that. Uh, the best value procurement. But the other part that's in the code that we really want to um, change is a cooperative purchasing agreement limitation. So this is specifically in the code that says we have we can only use a bid that is in the previous year, and that is typically a preceding one year. Um, there are bids that uh, take a lot of time and effort for these cooperative or cooperative um, groups to to manage and and actually solicit for. And so they may be two years old, they may be three years old, but the value is still there and it is still is valid and we can still piggyback on that. Especially with inflation, you know, a three-year-old bid might exactly. be Exactly. If there's a cooperative agreement out there on a, on a, a purchase <laughs> that we need in the next year or two, 
we can tap into that. We can use that. We can piggyback on that. The company may not like it, but it is an agreement. Um, and we do need to honor that. Um, but exactly. Um, so being able to go back further, you know, they might have done it three years ago. So, so giving us the ability to, to do that for us as well. And not limit us to that one year. Are the code changes contingent on the charter? Because, I mean, we have to go to the ballot to get a change to the charter. Can we not do it until it's approved? There that are and that's not that easy to do. Right, no, yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, you know, really the ballot <clears throat> questions are going to dictate what we can and can't change in the code. There are uh, some things in the code that we can address immediately, regardless of a ballot question. Um, but it really hinges on the on the charter. Um, that threshold, that dollar amount, that $5,000 amount is specifically in our charter. So can we pull that out? Can we put that in an ordinance? Can we put it in the code? So that you as a council can make a decision um, uh, whenever you'd like to. If you'd like to just add, I think, I don't know which one of the staff added the second bullet up there, but I think it's brilliant. It wasn't me. <laughs> um, move, thresh <laughs> move threshold from charter to code. Provide you guys the ability to review it every two years. How do we know 100,000 is going to be good in five years? Or three years, or one year, we or whatever, right. periodically. I agree. So we have to pass the ballot, and then we can change the ordinance. Not necessarily. There are some things in the ordinance that we can change. But with the bit, city sure. charter limits us on some some stuff. Yeah. I think that and that's what Reed is suggesting that we would take out uh, yeah. stuff that encumbers us, like I dollars. I think that makes a whole lot of sense. Yep. And this cooperative purchasing agreement, we, we can execute on <laughs> immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. What Reed said. Oops. <coughs> we'll Reed support. Yeah. yeah. I put we it agree. in one. So by raising the threshold to about hundred thousand, you know, I saw in your little chart, although it's you know hard to pinpoint exactly, but we've got about like forty five RFPs out <coughs> right now for good mm -hmm. services. That'll be you know, total by the end of the year. Oh, so that's the projected by the, end, by the end of the year. So what raising it to hundred thousand dollars, what would that reduce that number of uh, bids out to? Um, now we're really expanding in public works and capital. We're spending about three times as much in public works for capital improvement projects, so it's not a normal year. Sure. 30 would have set a record. If we can hit 30 this year, let alone 45. Mm -hmm. To answer your question, it's going to knock off at least 10, mm -hmm. if not 15. There's a, there's a lot of procurements under that. Dollar so bill. between 5 and 100. But to get things on a charter at this point, we've got to hurry up and do this. What is it, August? August? Yes. Yeah, we should hire a consultant to <gasps> run with that. <them. laughs> There's one. Oh, this is not a job. It's strategically <laughs> here. Well, we have like <laughs> two months to get this <laughs> thing on. So now. don't we have to make, what's the uh, timing that we get this on the ballot? I mean, we've got to get this on the ballot. Uh, well, yeah, that's what you said. So yeah. we're all, are we all on target? To do yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's why they're here right now. But I mean, talking to even 100,000 is mute if <laughs> this doesn't get passed. Correct. Yeah. It's so, just, Charter and code changes, people don't understand, and as we know, tend to vote no. That's why we need help. With the so with the hundred thousand, the only question I have is, you know, why a hundred thousand? Why not fifty? Why not two fifty? Based upon the study of the other seventeen cities, I have a chart in the handout. It shows that uh, Golden, yeah, yeah. Federal Heights, mm -hmm. Parker, and Louisville. Some of that population is 17,000 to 52. I think we're at 45,000. Mm -hmm. They're all at 100,000. They changed theirs all in 2018. So if we worked more toward the 50, we'd be looking at people that changed it around 9 11. Okay. Down that time frame. 100,000 is much more where the target is going. We also run into a little bit of a problem on the low thresholds where vendors will say, I don't want to bid because I make 20% margin, but I want to take half of that and use it to put a bid. I just go. Trim the trees at Geneva sure. Village without doing bids. I think that's a great point. So, for as much time as it takes us to actually put out a bid, it takes an equal amount of time for a vendor to actually have to respond to our documents that we've sent. They can go work somewhere. Sure, and it's like you know, it, at some point, it's not worth their time to actually respond to a small dollar kind of threshold limit. So, you can get feedback from vendors. Process and how long. Obviously, the 17 comparisons are not, you know, everything. You know, obviously, there's other communities that are missing. Are there other, you know, cities that have much higher thresholds over 100,000, or is 100,000 10? Colorado Springs has 250, and there's the most recent change, 2019. Wow. When we look at cities of our size, is that what you're looking at? Yes, I am. 100,000. And are there some cities that don't even have a requirement? 
I only came across two, as prescribed by Council. That wouldn't be very smart. No, I'm not bad. Like Rifle and Smitty Steamboat Springs. I can't remember the two. As prescribed by Council per year. By year. Sure, and I think that's a question that Council will actually have to weigh in on is, do we want to put it out the 100000 that's being recommended, actually put that number into our charter, raising it from 5 to 100 or 10 to 100 or do we want to, you know, you know, if we had a consultant to kind of query this question with our, our constituents, it would be, you know, how does it look if it's blank? How does it look if it's as set by city council? We remove that 5000 or 10000 and just put it in there as set by city council. And this is something that council can revisit from time to time. Okay. Or do we just want to put the number in there? Or can, has anyone ever tried tying it to a percentage of the city budget or the actual, like, volume of procurement? As in, like... For example, it can be a moving target year over year, depending on the size of budget and percentages. I don't know that I would, I, from my, my opinion, I don't know that I would want to do that because it, I think it just adds confusion to staff and what's, that, what's that limit. So if you keep it standard, mm -hmm. yeah. And you're saying we can, it would go into the code, we would review it every two years. Or however you, you, you want to set that. Or whatever. So, so you know we mentioned the 5,000 and the 10,000. <clears> 5,000 per capital and 10,000. So the 5,000 is in the charter, and that's what we're talking about. The 10,000 is actually in our city code that says we can change that every even number of year. Okay. Uh, so we would want to align that with that language that's in the code currently. Or it's in the charter, but by set by code. I don't know who's in charge of the consultant, but it seems to me something that we could <laughs> be change look order. at. <laughs> change order. Change order. Change order. What are you doing? How's all that play well for you? Oh, once well, so we have a contract in place, we're, we're bringing yeah, it. Yeah, we do a change order. We can, but let's say Chief Stevens over there hires five officers, new officers. And the council just approved a five-year agreement for a body can and tasers. We can't go change that per code right now. So, yeah, I mean, we saw this with, what was it, Cartograph? Mm -hmm. Where right. we had to add some licenses, and that's really what it was, but this was an agreement that was... Right ordered by council because it was a five-year agreement. It was in excess of those two years. But because we were changing that agreement, we go back to council. So we don't really have kind of built in a, a very robust kind of sliding scale. So, you know, I've seen it in other jurisdictions, I'm sure Dave has too, is, you know, if there's a contract approved for, let's say, a, a million dollars, and if there's a change order that comes in and it's for, you know, a percentage of that, say 10%, then that allows you know the procurement officer or the city manager or department head, whoever it is, to make that change without actually having to schedule it, come back to city council just to make something that's relatively menial, as we saw from Cartograph. I mean, that was a what, five thousand dollar increase, Not even. which took I don't know several weeks to get in front of council just to get five more licenses or twenty five more licenses. Is what we got. My no, guess no, well, that was Mark's fault for not getting it on our calendar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to, but Reed said no. <laughs> My guess is that um, if we have to go to ballot, that we're going to have to we do much better with an amount. That's my guess. I don't know if it's worth well, considering to Sean, see what I, the public thinks. I think that's, that's going to be one of the issues that mm -hmm. we're going to report back to you on. So we are poised through our consultant to test that question. And I, I think the direction, in fact, there's the next steps. Thank you. So Ju July 12th is when we're going to come back. Our <coughs> are going to share the results of what they've discovered on that issue. So after that, when we get into the de decision point in August, you'll have to decide, is it a dollar amount or you shift it out of there into a different approach there? Yeah. Can you briefly touch on the contract link too? It looks like... We're the only ones that put a limit on it. Yeah, so that's the, the two years that we're limited. Oh, the two, okay. Yeah, that's what that is. Okay. But we can do over two years still. I mean, <laughs> you just have to ask council. Yeah. You have, you, yes. You yeah, have. I mean, there are, without getting too technical, there are some Tabor limitations which um, prohibit the agreement to a multi fiscal year terms. But the way that I've seen other jurisdictions do it is you enter into, say, maybe a five year agreement. And so it's a one-year agreement with four automatic renewals, mm -hmm. which gives us the ability, if we need to pivot. Nice track it, yeah. If Nardi's not, not, Nardi's not here. <clears throat> but after, you know, two years, then maybe there was a better product that came out here. Yes, we've kind of locked in those terms. We've locked in those rates. But we do have an ability to get out 
if for some reason there's a budget issue that happens or you know there's a better product that's come out or better pricing that's come out um, an ability for us to shift without being necessarily stuck to that agreement for five years so Where we but yes in, in, in our issue. charter it talks about two years so anything that's yeah. going to be over two years like the software licensing something that we have to bring to council right now and, and many of these companies are used to dealing with those kind of things too it's not like we're the only city in the sure. entire country but that cooperative that purchasing, that purchasing has to go to ballot too no, no, that's code that's just code code code. Because that's kind of hard to understand. Okay. Yeah, yeah. good. Thank you for that. But they to Reed's point, we, we tried to do this today in terms of doing the, what do you call it, a one plus four. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but some of these vendors are also smart, and they realize, well, what's really in it for us? And if you're not going to commit to five years, we're not going to give you the discount. Mm -hmm. So that's where if we can make a charter amendment to take care of this, that helps us in those situations where those vendors won't agree to the one plus four. I think Public Works, again, is another one that faces this all the time. AutoCAD said no to the one point. I one mean, we're going to try it for the first time, the one plus four, and AutoCAD said no. Just on the pricing piece. I should just hung up on it. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm supportive of the recommendation. I'd like yep. to yeah. do it. Yeah. No problem. You had me at high. <laughs> great discussion. Not, not Tiffany did. Not Tiffany did. Huh? Yeah, that's great. No, very good. Thank you for bringing us. Yeah. <coughs> Appreciate your time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Is that it? We're done. Well, we got city manager. Any update? Oh wait, Tiffany. Yeah, Tiffany. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Gary, for giving us his own innovation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Appreciate that. Right, I'll uh, be here all night. Yeah, yeah. I'll be here all week. <laughs> There's a LPS board meeting uh, for East Community Center on Thursday evening. Just throwing that out there to folks if they want to participate. When is that again? Uh, it's uh, on the 12th of this Thursday um, at 5 p.m. for the so uh, Steve Mark development of the East Community Center. Steve Mark so, what time? Five. Five. Thank you. Nothing from you? Nothing from me. City Attorney? Uh, Councilmember Barr took all my time. So, guys, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Steve. Yeah, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, all right. We're adjourned. <laughs> adjourned.